Okay. Okay. Uh, last lecture. We're starting a few minutes early, but nobody ever complains about getting away early, so uh, we will press on. Uh, pull up my lecture. Last lecture, I want to talk about the normal Christian life. We've been laying out so far some sort of I laid out the general theological principles and then came to talk about the definition of mortification, what it wasn't, what it is, the guidelines or basic principles that Owen lays out for its pursuit. And I want to speak in the last lecture on the normal context for mortification. All that I've said so far could be understood in a very individual way, I think. And that would be a mistake. One of the... the major emphases in the New Testament, I think, is the emphasis upon the corporate solidarity of the church, if I could put it that way. The church is described as a body. There is a sense in which Christians, we do not exist as isolated individuals. We are part of the overall church of Christ. We're part of the body of Christ. Paul makes it very clear that what goes on in one part of the body affects another. That's why in his letters often there is news exchanged between congregations uh, because he wants them to rejoice at good news that uh, the word is going forth in one place or he wants them to pray particularly for an aspect of the work in another place. The New Testament lays before us a vision of uh, Christianity as a corporate activity, not to deny that there aren't individuals who make up the body of the church, but the church is to be seen as a whole. Paul even uses analogies to the human body when he talks about eyes and ears and hands and feet. Uh, there is a sense in which the individuals make up that which is the whole. The church finds its perfection and completion, if you like, through the variety of individuals who make it up. And that brings me to uh, really the final point today, and that is that mortification is something best understood in a corporate context. That so often we think of our struggle against sin as something which we need to pursue individually. Whereas in actual fact, the normal Christian life is a corporate life. Uh, I was talking to a friend who's a minister in the PCA just a couple of weeks ago, and I was asking him what he did about counseling in his congregation, and he said he had a number of rules about counseling, but the first one was, if the person's not attending church, I don't counsel them. And his rationale for that was, if the person's not sitting under the regular preaching of the Word, there's nothing I can do for them anyway. That the first and foremost context for the Christian life is the gathered worship of the church under the sound of God's Word. Uh, why would that be the case? Well, I think as, uh, as Protestants, we understand that the Word of God is the place where God's presence is mediated. If you're a Roman Catholic or if you were to go to a medieval Roman Catholic church uh, in Europe, you walk through the doors, your eyes would be drawn immediately to the altar at the far end because that's where the Mass takes place. The Mass is the crowning moment of the service in Roman Catholicism, because it is in the Mass that Christ comes down and is present with His people in the elements of the bread and the wine, or the transubstantiation of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. In Protestantism, the pulpit is central and higher. This is a good example, in fact. Pulpit's at the center of activities and is slightly higher than the floor below. There's nothing magical in that position. The Bible doesn't say you have to put your pulpit there, but it is a reflection of a Protestant understanding of the importance of the preached word. The most important thing that happens in a Protestant church uh, on a Sunday is the preaching of the word. Why is that? Because the word is the means by which God's special saving presence is mediated. We know from the Old Testament that the word of God is more than just uh, God describing the way things are in creation. God doesn't describe the light. He says, let there be light, and then light comes into being. Uh, we know in the Old Testament that God's presence, God's special presence with His people, is often 
articulated in terms of his speech. He speaks to Abraham. Uh, the Shunammite, uh, when her son dies, she goes and almost drags the prophet Elisha back to uh, her house where the child lies dead. The staff in the hands of the servant won't do the trick. Well, God is powerful. He could have raised the child using the, the prophet's staff, but he chooses not to do so. Why? Because the prophet's speech is the way that God is savingly present. And, of course, in Amos, we're told that the most terrible famine that is to come against the land is the famine of the Word of God. They'll go from north to south and east to west to find the Word of God, but they will not find it. God will be silent. It's the prophet's way of saying God will be functionally absent from the people. God is everywhere. He's in South America even as he's in uh, ancient Israel. But God is specially present according to his promise only where his word comes. And then in the New Testament, we see the, the arrival of God's word. The heavens are torn open. In the Gospel of Mark, we're told the heavens are torn open uh, at Christ's baptism. There was an old Jewish gloss on a passage in Isaiah that said God would be absent and silent until the heavens were torn open. And then in Mark chapter 1, the heavens are torn open. And what happens straight away? A voice from heaven. God's speech. God is once again marvelously and miraculously savingly present with his people. And that goes on, I think, into the, the theology of Paul. Uh, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Preaching is absolutely central to the ministry of Paul. Preaching is where the word of God is powerfully declared. And in the congregation of the saints, the preaching of the word of God comes with power. Now, you might say, yes, but my sin is this. And the pastor has never addressed that from the pulpit. Well, that carries me back to the first lecture. Uh, that which distinguishes your sin from other sins is ultimately of less account in God's eyes than that which unites it with all other sins. It is a specific manifestation of a general problem that everybody has. If your pastor is preaching and proclaiming the gospel, then that will address uh, the issue of particular sins. And how does preaching do that? Well, first of all, I think preaching is a reminder of our identity. Uh, preaching is, you know, what does preaching do? Preaching preaches the two ages of Adam and Christ, if you like. What are you doing when you preach? You are declaring that human beings belong to one age or the other, the age of Adam or the age of Christ. I think that the proclamation of the Word, though, is, is more than that. That when the Word is proclaimed, one isn't simply describing those two ages. One is, in a, in a way, dramatically making those two ages real. God's speech is creative speech. I believe preaching is creative and powerful. Uh, one could draw many analogies, I suppose, with the world around, but uh, think of uh, the marriage ceremony when the minister declares, I now declare you man and wife, uh, husband and wife, man and wife, whatever the precise wording uh, is. He doesn't simply describe a state of affairs. He brings a state of affairs into existence. Perhaps a, a, a closer analogy with Christians sitting under the preaching of the Word might be this. Uh, if you're married, I trust that uh, on a regular basis you say to your spouse, I love you. And the, the question, you know, ask yourself, well, am I describing a state of affairs? Or am I bringing a state of affairs into existence when I say that? Uh, I would say both. Both. Uh, you say, I love you. You're telling your wife, your husband, of a state of affairs. But the statement itself also brings the state of affairs about, does it not? And if you don't believe me, just don't say it. For a, you know, uh, you know run, run an experiment. Don't say to your wife that you love her for 12 months. And if she says to you, do you still love me? You know, with a sort of soulful look in her eyes at the end of it, turn around and say, look, 
told her I loved you 12 months ago. You know, if, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Uh, and see if it makes any difference. Um, I will, so I, I'll leave that for you, for you to experiment with. Um, I trust that Stan's indemnity insurance covers kind of, you know, marriages falling apart as a result of advice you've received from the, the pulpit here. <clears throat> the preaching of the Word of God is powerful. And I think the first, uh, uh, the first thing it does is it reminds and reinforces our identity as Christians. When you look at Paul's letters and you look at the logic of argument in Paul's letters, they move typically from a statement about a state of affairs or identity to practical applications flowing from it. Colossians is a great example. Ephesians would be another example. You start off with a, a statement about identity, which then flows into direct, specific advice on how to operate in particular circumstances. The public reading and preaching of the Word is a powerful means of mortification, first because it reinforces our identity. Secondly, it's powerful because it strikes deep at the general cause of our problems rather than trying to deal with the symptoms. Again, Think of particular sins that you're prone to as symptomatic of a deeper problem. Uh, if you go to the doctor and say, I'm suffering from a headache, or I have this rash on my skin, and the doctor uh, treats you, gives you a painkiller for the headache, or he gives you some skin cream that will try to get rid of the rash, but the problem is you've got meningitis, the treating of the symptoms is no good. You don't need a specific salve for the individual symptoms from which you're suffering. You need a general cure for the root problem. The root problem is you've got this poison flowing around in your blood. You've got the meningitis virus flowing through your blood. And you need something to attack that general problem. One of the, uh, the things that I find most striking about Paul's letters, even in the application is how general they are. Paul addresses the issue in Colossians by making general statements about the truth that is in Christ. And that's the basis for his particular applications. But then when you look at his particular applications, they're actually pretty vague and broad. There are people in the Christian world who've made a lot of money out of writing lots and lots, well, writing the same book lots and lots of times on marriage, for example. You can go to whole 12-week seminars on a Christian approach to marriage. It strikes me as remarkable that Paul says, you know, husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands, and then he moves on to the, to the, to the next advice for the next group of people. Now, I don't want to trivialize things and say there isn't a place sometimes for expert particular advice on particular problems that may pop up. But by and large, Paul gives pretty straightforward, broad stroke advice a lot of the time. He lays out the general truths in Christ, then he draws some general applications, and then he concludes his letter. Sometimes in his letters, yes, he'll have specific, you know, I plead with Euodia and Syntyche, they get on together. He's heard about particular issues and he'll speak very particularly into those circumstances. But by and large, Paul deals in generalities. It doesn't seem to me that Paul regards marital counseling as too complicated. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, which is a difficult thing to do, but not a hard thing to understand. Wives submit to your husbands, a difficult thing to do, but not a hard thing to understand. So, don't, uh, 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 the, the second reason I think that uh, the general preaching is good is it actually reflects Pauline priorities. Paul operates in generalities. Even when he comes to applications, he's still operating at a level of, of broad generality. If I think if Paul was here today and you say to Paul, you know, oh, I've got a lot of marital problems in the Christian world today, Paul would say, well, it comes down to two things. Husbands aren't loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And wives 
aren't submitting to their husbands uh, as, as the church submits to Christ. I think you'd, you'd say, and all of the particular variations uh, are, are variations on those two basic themes. Third reason why I think the, 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 the general proclamation of the word provides the basic context for mortification of sin is this. It is no respecter of your understanding of yourself. Now, Luther has this wonderful phrase. He talks about the preached word as the word that comes from outside. When you think about the psychology of uh, indwelling sin and its ruthless, comprehensive, and inveterate desire to drag you back to the old age, it's going to use everything it can to do that, including that little voice inside your head. And one of the things that Luther gets so right, I think, is that we all need the word that comes from outside. And even our reading of the Bible as individuals can be twisted by our inner sinful dispositions. Well, that bit of Scripture doesn't really apply to me, or, you know, you, we rush over certain passages because we don't really want to dwell on their implications for our lives. Uh, we focus on passages that we like and uh, speak particularly positively to us. Great thing about sitting under the regular expository preaching of the Word is you have no choice essentially what you listen to. It's a word coming to you from outside. It's not mediated through your own sort of interpretative filters, if you like. It's being declared to you from outside, taken by the Holy Spirit and applied to your heart. Is it a foolproof method? No, because you can still choose which bits you listen to, which bits you don't. But it's harder. It's harder to avoid those bits you don't like when the Word is coming to you from outside. The Word comes from outside and it forces you to confront those aspects of your life that you wish to avoid. It's interesting, I can deal with one of the questions I've received now. Um, regarding God speaking peace into the heart, what does this mean or look like? Well, I think a lot of times that kind of thing will come in the worship service of the church. If the worship service is properly structured... If the minister and the people leading worship know what they're doing, then it may well come in the worship service. Uh, for example, at the, the church where I'm a, a minister, we always have, at some point in the, the morning service, we will have a passage of the Old Testament read, and then we have a corporate confession of sin. Sometimes it's written, we all say it together, sometimes the uh, minister at the front leads us in prayer. Sometimes we read the Ten Commandments together as a congregation. And then after that is done, the minister, whoever's leading worship, will read a passage of Scripture that speaks the Gospel. It talks about, cry, about God putting our sins as far as the East is from the West. That could be the moment when God speaks peace to you. You feel terribly dirty. The devil's whispering in your ear that you're too dirty to reach out and touch God because you will make him dirty. And that word comes from outside. As high and as wicked as your sins are, the Lord has placed them as far from him as the east is from the west. And the Holy Spirit presses that on your heart. You grasp that by faith, and that could be the moment when the Lord speaks peace to your heart. On the other hand, maybe you've been speaking peace to yourself all week. My sins aren't that bad. And then you're sitting there in the congregation and you have to read the Ten Commandments with everybody else. And the Holy Spirit may take those Ten Commandments and use them to rip your heart right open. And maybe when that word of peace comes at the end, maybe it doesn't speak peace to you. Maybe there's work yet to be done in your heart. But I would say, in answer to that question, when God, regarding God speaking peace to us, what does this mean or look like? I would say, I'm thinking probably nine times out of ten, it means that you grasp the word that is spoken to you on a Sunday by faith. Why else is corporate preaching important? Because the most effective preacher, well, the most effective preachers, well, the, the preachers who have you most of the week are not 
preaching the new age to you. They're preaching the old age. You're watching the television. You're chatting to friends at work. Even that voice inside your head. All of these voices have a vested interest in convincing you that you belong to the old age. Corporate preaching of the word reminds you, no, you're a member of the new age. The old age is passing away. Set your minds on things above. So the first uh, area I would argue for looking for help and mortification is the preaching of the word, the corporate preaching of the word on a Sunday. Secondly, I would, uh, I would suggest another area of uh, worship, uh, of, of the corporate context for mortification, is worship songs, hymns. If you look at uh, Colossians, Colossians 3, verse 16. Remember, this is in the context of mortification, putting to death, putting on. And in the context of that, Paul says this, that the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, uh, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Worship, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is going to be an important part of what Paul is talking about here, which is putting to death the old age and putting on the clothes of the new age. And that's a reminder, I think, for something we often neglect when we think about worship. Uh, sometimes some people get too wrapped up in, is worship what makes me feel good here and now? I think that drives a lot, not just of contemporary worship, but some, I think, uh, advocates of traditional worship want to sing traditional things because it's comforting. It's what they've always sung. Uh, Sometimes we focus uh, appropriately on the vertical dimension of worship. We need to make sure that that which we sing is appropriate as a kind of offering to God. Not a sacrificial, redemptive offering, but we want to make sure that what we do corporately as a church is done in a way that brings true honor to God's name. A neglected aspect, I think, of worship is this horizontal aspect that Paul lays out here. Part of uh, being refueled on a Sunday for the Christian life Monday to Saturday is what we sing. But we don't just sing it to God, we sing it to each other as well. It's kind of an odd thing to think about, but that seems to be what Paul is saying here. That what we sing, the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, has a horizontal aspect to it as well. And when you think, if you think about how many of the Psalms are, uh, the Psalms are certainly songs of praise to God, but then many of them are also interesting explorations, are they not, of human psychology. Psalm where the psalmist says, you know, I was envious of the proud and the wicked. They seem, everything seems to go well for them. Uh, I almost stumbled in my envy of the, these people who seem to live wonderful lives and, and, and even die peacefully. And then I went into the sanctuary of the Lord and everything made sense. The psalm sort of takes you through, if you like. It's a, I would say, say therapeutic would be to, to down, you know, to... to would have unfortunate connotations today. But what that psalm does is it talks you through a process of coming to terms with surely one of the biggest issues uh, any Christian faces is, you know, why do the wicked seem to prosper and good people, you know, why do the good die young in so many cases? The psalmist takes you through that. And in singing that psalm, you'd not only be offering praise to God, but as a body, you're teaching yourselves a way of thinking about an aspect of covenant experience. So, a second prong to the corporate dimension of mortification, I think, is worship. 
the things we sing. And I would say this should set before us an expectation. We should come to church expecting, expecting to receive help in dealing with our particular issues. I sometimes wonder if the, 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 the various reasons, I'm sure, for the rising amount of one-to-one -one Christian counseling that goes on. But I wonder if some of it is down to the fact that people don't come to church and expect to find the answer to their particular problem in the general proclamation of the Word and in the general liturgical action of the, of the service. And if at the bottom of that lies that sneaky narcissism that we are so unique that while the general preaching may avail for others, our problem is such that we need particular treatment and care. I remember being very struck reading uh, Michael Horton's excellent book, uh, Christless Christianity, a couple of years ago. And he gives the anecdote there of the lady who comes to his church one Sunday evening. Uh, and her marriage is on the rocks. And she comes to his church and just hears the gospel being proclaimed. And she says to him, you know, it's just what she needed to hear. Because at the church where she normally worshipped, they were going through like a 12-week series on how to put your marriage back together. And that wasn't the solution to putting her marriage back together. The solution was hearing about the passing away of the old age and her identity in the new age. So we need to cultivate within ourselves, I think, an attitude uh, that says we go to church expecting our individual particular problems to be directly addressed through the general preaching and general application of the Word of God. The sacraments. I think the sacraments play a vital role as well. Uh, it's very interesting when you look at the... Well, from, from often from an evangelical Protestant perspective today, it can be weird to remember that more ink was spilt in the 16th century on the issue of the Lord's Supper than on justification by grace through faith. The big issue in many ways in the Reformation were the sacraments and the Lord's Supper. That was what blew... Uh, the church apart. That was what blew Protestantism apart. And if you read the works of, say, a Calvin, or you go to the Book of Common Prayer, the great Anglican liturgy prepared by Thomas Cranmer, it is very clear that they regard the Lord's Supper as something that strengthens Christians. It has implications for the Christian life. Now again, going back to the, uh, I'm you know, giving you some really bad advice on how to uh, ruin your marriage at this point. You might say, well, but, but surely does, does the Lord's Supper give us, uh, does it give us Christ, a, a different Christ? Well, Calvin has a, a nice phrase. Calvin says, you know, the Lord's Supper does not give us a different Christ, but it gives us Christ differently and better in some ways. Think about, uh, you know, I'm going to pick on husbands again. It's your wife's birthday. Uh, you give her a present. You give her a good present. I made a terribly fatal mistake. Well, not quite fatal. But um, I was coming back from Brazil earlier this year. And uh, I'd assumed that in Brazil, the, the, the duty-free would be a good place to get my wife a present. When I get to the duty-free in, uh, in Brasilia, it's a tiny little shop. I've gone through security, so I'm trapped. I've got to get my wife something. And, and this is the only shop between me and her, essentially. Uh, and I end up buying her. Well, I thought I'd buy some expensive cosmetics, but I fatally, like most husbands, I just grabbed something off the shelf and bought it. I fatally forgot to look at what was on the label. Uh, when I gave it to my wife, it was anti-wrinkle cream. Um, <laughs> that's uh, dangerous. Well... I was actually, I was in Brazil again uh, earlier, uh, it was actually just last month, and I was with uh, a couple of other uh, lecturers, and we were ex exchanging sort of, you know, disastrous gifts we bought our wives kind of story. Uh, and uh, the, the, the other, one of the other guys told me that he'd been lecturing in Hungary in the mid-80s before the wall had come down, before the Iron Curtain had come down. And... Uh, He'd found, of course, in those days, you couldn't bring money out of the country. You had to spend all your, your Hungarian money. So he, he bought his wife seven cans of deodorant in the, uh, 
in the uh, uh, duty free, which we agreed was probably more disastrous than the anti wrinkle cream. I was, I was prepared to uh, seed the field to him at that point. And I actually used that anecdote with my wife say, See, I'm not that bad. I would never buy you, you know. And one can't help feeling that seven cans of deodorant somehow sounds worse than one can of deodorants, even though it would be more expensive. Uh, anyway, if, if it's your wife's birthday and you buy her a present, and the question I would raise again is, uh, does that simply symbolize your love, or does it do something mysterious and deeper? And you'd have to say, well, there's a sense in which it doesn't mean you love your wife anymore. Uh, you, your love for her is just the same. But if you didn't give her a present, you'd notice the difference. You know, she wouldn't speak to you maybe for days, weeks, months, who knows. But you notice the difference. Certainly the atmosphere would either drop a few degrees or rise a few degrees depending on the temperament of your marriage. But the reformers saw the Lord's Supper like that. The Lord's Supper did not give uh, a different Christ. It gave Christ differently. That it was important that it not, didn't just symbolize the binding together of the body, but it actually, in a mysterious way, sort of raises one's mind to Christ and seals the gospel more firmly on one's heart. So again, to go back to that question regarding God speaking peace into the heart, maybe it could come at the Lord's Supper sometime. And uh, I also, as I, I alluded earlier on, I think the Lord's Supper... A church which teaches a rich doctrine of the Lord's Supper has a most powerful discipline and discipling tool at its disposal. I gave one example of the young man who'd come to me and said, you know, that he no longer felt repentant, no longer desired deliverance from his sin. And it was interesting that the withholding of the Lord's Supper from him that morning brought him to his senses. It's a great example of the use of the sacraments to bring home to somebody the seriousness of this situation. I was told uh, recently about another pastor in my own denomination, the OPC, who found that his own, uh, the amount of time that he had to spend counseling married couples dropped dramatically when he introduced a weekly Lord's Supper. Think about that. Why would that be? Because every Sunday, people's minds were focused on being reconciled with their Christian brothers and sisters, you know. Don't come to the Lord's Supper if there's something. If you've got something in your heart against somebody else, go and sort that out first before you come to the Lord's Supper. Very interesting. The introduction of weekly Lord's Supper here helped focus individuals' minds on issues in their lives and pushed them along that path of mortification that, Paul, uh, uh, that uh, Owen points towards. So the public reading and teaching of God's words, the sacraments, and then, of course, thirdly, the Westminster uh, Confession. I, I think this is not the case in the three forms of unity as Cornerstone uh, subscribe here, but in the Westminster Standards, the means of grace are three, not just word and sacrament, but also prayer. And I've often wondered about uh, the prayer as, a mean, prayer as a means of grace, because we tend to think of means of grace as that which God does for us. The Word comes from God to us. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. God is the agent in baptism. He's the agent in the Lord's Supper. It's not something we do. When the minister uh, officiates at the Lord's Supper, he specifically speaks about ministering in Christ's name. He doesn't act by his own authority at that point. He acts on behalf of God, who is the supreme agent in the Lord's Supper or in baptism. Prayer. Prayer has always puzzled me as to why is prayer a means of grace? Well, I think two great reasons. One, well, actually, no, I, 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 yes, I, I, it's two reasons, but the second one I'll divide uh, into, into two. First of all, prayer is a means of grace because the supreme prayer is God. Why is prayer powerful 
on our behalf because ultimately the one, the one who really prays for us is God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. His prayer before God the Father is the means of God the Father granting the Lord Jesus Christ that which he desires. It brings, if you like, the work of Christ to its completion. And the wonderful thing about the intercession of Christ at the right hand of the Father is, of course, that Christ is truly God. And therefore, Christ asks for nothing from the Father which the Father does not wish to grant him. Uh, we can have very wrong views, I think, about the intercession of Christ at the right hand of the Father. We can have this view of Christ's work that somehow God the Father is the, you know, he's the angry one of the three. But, you know, at some point the son is able to persuade him, you know, Father, let me go down and, and act on behalf. Okay, okay, son, go down and, and act on behalf of them. And then the son returns to heaven and he then, you know, his father is sitting there. He still doesn't want to, you know, save a people for himself. But the son pleads with his father. And because he's the father's son, the father finally gives in. As the way, you know, if your son or daughter come and beg you, uh, to let them you know, have their friends around for a sleepover at some point, and slowly but surely your heart is softened until finally, you know, against your better judgment or whatever, you allow it to happen. And that can be how we think of the intercession of Christ in heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches about the intercession of Christ in heaven. We tend to think of intercession as a slightly adversarial thing. That is not the case in heaven. Father and Son are one God. They will and desire the same things. And therefore, when the son asks for something, the father will grant it to him because the father wants the same thing. It has been appointed in the scheme of things that the son's intercession will be the means by which the father grants the son that which he desires. But the son's intercession is guaranteed in terms of its success. So prayer, when we're thinking about mortification, what is, when we think about prayer, what is the first thing we need to think about? And that is, the Son's desire for us. The Son is praying and interceding on our behalf. Not only do we have this identity in Christ, but we have an advocate with the Father who pleads on our behalf to the Father and whose prayer is guaranteed because He is God as the Father is God. Secondly, I think corporate prayer can be a help to us as well. Corporate prayer of confession. Being led in prayer. One of the things that seminaries do, well, I wouldn't say we do it badly. I don't think we do it at all. We certainly don't do it at Westminster East. I can't uh, say with certainty they don't do it elsewhere. But we don't teach people how to lead in prayer at my seminary. And that's outrageous. I think we live in an era where we become so used to the... the uh, the idea that if you do something in public that's different from what you do in private, it's somehow not authentic. Um, well, I said to a student this week, you know, I sing in the shower. But man, you don't want me singing in church the way I sing in the shower. Uh, that would be absolutely terrible. You want me singing much more quietly because I have a terrible voice apart from anything else. Public prayer, I think, fulfills a useful function. People come to church sometimes and they don't know what words to pray. They don't know how to approach God. Some of them are so crushed by their sin, they don't lift their eyes heavenward. And leading those people into the presence of God by prayer can be a means of grace to them, I think. I thank God that I uh, spent some years in the Free Church of Scotland where all men were expected to be able to lead the congregation in prayer. You became a member of the church you expect it at the prayer meeting to be able to lead the congregation in prayer. Ter Free church prayer meetings were terrifying. Sorry, ladies, they only ever called on the men, but the women were quite glad they weren't called on because it was such an ordeal. Uh, but you'd get called on to pray, and you're expected to lead the congregation in prayer into the presence of God. And boy, you learn quick how to lead in prayer. Going to church to be led into an appropriate, uh, to be taught an appropriate approach into the presence of God 
think is, is very, very important. It's a means of grace. And then the second aspect of that is uh, personal prayer. The mortification of sin requires much prayer on our part, confession of sin, praying that the Lord would show us areas of our lives where we need to put sin to death, praying that He would provide us with the Holy Spirit so that we might begin to live more and more here and now, that life of the new age that Paul speaks about in his letters. Mortification is not simply a question of grasping techniques and going out and doing them. It involves calling out to God for help in identifying our sins, in being sensitive to when those sins are getting a hold on us, having consciences that are sensitive to the bad things that can happen to us. And finally, I want to emphasize then, in concluding this uh, particular lecture, that what I'm setting before you here and now is very ordinary. What is mortification of spear? Uh, mortification of spin? That's my podcast, not what I'm talking about today. What is mortification? Mortification of spin doesn't mean anything at all. What is mortification of sin? What does it not mean? Well, we've, we've seen some of these things, but I would add the final one of this. It doesn't mean anything spectacular. It doesn't mean anything spectacular. There is no silver bullet in this. There is no wait for the second blessing that will suddenly lift you far above uh, the plane of, of sanctification where you currently exist. Call it the normal Christian life. We might say the ordinary Christian life. There is a real glut of books on the market at the moment that use the term radical in them or some version of that. We're all into radical Christianity now. I want to suggest to you that the mortification of sin is really rather boring. And it comes down to a couple of things. It involves knowing yourself and your weaknesses. It involves knowing the Lord, who He is and what He's done. And it involves regular attendance at church, sitting under the sound of the Word and listening and praying that the Holy Spirit will apply that Word to your life to enable you to walk worthy Monday to Saturday. It's very boring. That's what it is. But that, I think, is the vision of the Christian life that the New Testament lays out before you. And with this, I'll close. What are elders? Well, among other things, I think what elders are is elders are meant to embody in their lives that to which Christians should aspire. Elders are to be examples. It's one of the reasons why I think the eldership is to be guarded quite carefully because people look to the elders to see what the church is like. It's why you know, the Catholic sex abuse scandal has been so disastrous for the Catholic church because it's priests doing it. If it was ordinary members of the Catholic Church doing it, it wouldn't have been so traumatic. But the fact that it's priests, people think the priests symbolize in a certain way the ideal aspirations of the church. Elders are to represent the ideal aspirations of the church. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul starts off the chapter by saying this saying is trustworthy, almost certainly indicating that this is a standard way of referring to this topic that's already circulating in the church. Uh, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer who desires a noble task, the eldership is noble. Therefore, Paul goes on, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. He must be well thought of at by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace. What's Paul describing there? Very boring people. If that person's living next to you, you'll think well of him, but you'll hardly notice him. 
You won't hear him screaming and shouting at his kids because he manages his household well. Uh, you won't hear him fighting with his wife because he's the husband of one wife. And whatever else, the two, they're devoted to each other. He's a peaceable guy. He doesn't go out and pick fights in the neighborhood. You never hear him coming home at 3 o'clock in the morning drunk and you know, singing Danny Boy and throwing bricks through people's windows. He doesn't do that kind of stuff. He's in bed by 11 o'clock at night. Paul there lays out the, the qualifications for the kind of people that he wants to run the church because they epitomize that for which all Christians, that to which all Christians should aspire. And it's remarkably boring. There's nothing radical there. This is an ordinary guy in your neighborhood that you wouldn't even notice other than to have good thoughts of him. And that is my final comment today, and that is mortification of sin is an important function of the broader Christian life. And what is the broader Christian life? It's pretty boring and nondescript, really. And the ways and means of approaching the subject are pretty boring and nondescript. Thanks very much. <clears throat>